Okay, first I'd like to start in uh, Mark <clears throat> chapter 1. And um, I want to sort of uh, just give a last scripture from our last class, which I think was entitled, He Hid What Men Would Exalt. <clears throat> Huh? Well, that's the, that should be the title for the last one. Anyway, um, uh, the scriptures in Mark chapter 1, <clears throat> verse 40. And this is, you know, this is very common. This is one of many uh, scriptures that are like this. And when I say many, I mean there's a lot. You'd be surprised. But Mark chapter 1, verse 40 and there came a leper to him, beseeching him, and kneeling down to him, and saying unto him, If thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. And Jesus moved with compassion, put forth his hand, and touched him, and saith unto him, I will, be thou clean. As soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy departed from him, and he was cleansed. And he strictly charged him, and forthwith sent him away, and saith unto him, See, Thou say nothing to any man, but go thy way, show thyself to the priest, because he said, show thyself to the priest, because that was the law. That's how you dealt with lepers. <clears throat> um, but show thyself to the priest, and offer for thy cleansing those things which Moses commanded for a testimony unto them. But notice verse 40, 45, but he went out, and began to publish it much, and to spread abroad the matter, insomuch that Jesus could no more openly enter into the city, but was out in the desert places, and they came to him from every quarter. <clears throat> now, I know people who would read this and say, well, that ending was great, man. I mean, they made Jesus popular. But Jesus, you know, our first responsibility is to follow Jesus. <laughs> and Jesus said, don't tell anybody. And he has reasons for that. And many times in our zeal, we have all sorts of ambitions and all sorts of things that we're going to do that's going to exalt the Lord when in reality, because of his nature and because of his view of not seeking official glory, but simply trying to manifest the glory that would come by, well, but simply have the glory that would come by the manifestation of nature, um, so, and notice in my translation, it says, and Jesus strictly charged him, strictly charged him, um, and forthwith sent him away, and saith unto him, see thou say nothing to any man. Okay. <clears throat> so, that is one of so many examples where Jesus... Uh, hides the very thing that we would exalt. The very thing that we would use. The very thing that we would actually, I mean, if you want to know the truth of it, we would say, God used me to do this miracle to, to bring him glory, which is really translated that I would be glorified in, you know, being a man of God or a woman of God or someone of God. <clears throat> and anytime the Lord does stuff like that, you know, uh, God used you to heal somebody or use someone, you know, in one of these churches that wasn't well known, well then what does he do? Well, he goes out and starts the first church of the leper healing ministry or something like that. And that's so common. <clears throat> but Jesus uh, was supposed to function as man was meant to function. Okay, just, what does that statement mean that I just said? What does it mean? That Jesus is supposed to function the way man was meant to function. Okay, born-again man 
is filling churches that is doing just the opposite of this. And I'm not being critical of that. I'm just trying to show that Jesus is the prototype. The word prototype coming from the word firstborn. Protokoos, I think, is the actual Greek word. Firstborn, the prototype of all men. Well, we're not following his example. We're not following him. We're not pursuing what he's pursuing. He's not seeking official glory. <coughs> All right, however, keep in mind, and I keep saying this, though Jesus is not seeking official glory, when it is given, he responds many, many times. <clears throat> okay? Um, yeah? Yeah. Right. Right. Amen. And and that being said, the, what we can comprehend, or one of the angles we can comprehend from that, <clears throat> um, uh, and I say one of the angles, because there are many angles of comprehension, just like there are many angles of of uh, viewing things. For example. Um, this past week, we had our living room sheetrocked and the stairwell and everything. And uh, if you've ever had that done, the stairs, well, the whole house, but the stairs were covered with little tiny pieces of white everywhere and little minute and dust and everything. <clears throat> and I was told by several different people that to use your vacuum cleaner to get that up will ruin your nice vacuum cleaner <clears throat> and so what I decided to do was I sat on each stair and I picked up one by one every piece that I could pick up and put it in the, the thing so that when I finally did vacuum it wouldn't have all this big so I, I picked it all up and I remember because you're you're leaning like this way with your back against the staircase looking at it and when I got through I went praise God this stair is done but I needed to shift my hips on the next step. I shifted to the other side, so I'd be sitting on the other hip. And when I did, I, I got a view of the step I just finished from another angle. And I thought, I remember, I, I thought, this is clean. And if anyone came in at that moment before I shifted and said, well, that's not really clean, I'd go, Shit, it is, man. I've been sitting here for a long time picking at this, working at this. What do you mean it ain't clean? You know, you know, you understand about our lives, don't you? That we think we're better off and cleaner and better, and, and mainly because we've been working at something from one particular angle for a while. But I got news for you. There's more. God's not finished with you yet. He, he'll, you know, and when you get that other angle, you just go, oh, my God. I, you know, I'm embarrassed. You know, I would have been because had I left and then, you know, Deb came in and said, you know, well, I did, I did a bunch of extra work for you. And she'd walk up and go, well, you should have finished. And she wouldn't have said that, but I mean, and then I would have looked and gone, oh, man, I thought it was clean. I thought it was a good job. <clears throat> so I say that to say there are many angles of things, angles of truth. There are many angles of how well we think we're doing. And when you think you're even at your best, all God has to do is shift you to another angle. And you go, you know, and, and that, what is the conclusion when he does that? I still need Jesus. Best thing to do is always just keep your heart right there. Just keep your heart right there. I still need Jesus. And when, when you, you haven't shifted angles yet, but everything looks good, 
you can assume I still need Jesus. Never get to a place. You know, some people are trying to work to a place where they don't need Jesus anymore. Well, that's ridiculous. <laughs> that's ridiculous. <clears throat> Especially since he's the one who fulfills all this stuff. If you think he's the one who shapes you up, then you don't need him at a certain juncture. But if he fulfills all of it, you'll always need him. <clears throat> anyway... Um, so there is, a, there is this other angle, and a lot of times, and, I, and I've made that, you know, I've made that mistake too uh, in ministry, and that is the Lord would tell me something, and I would not really heed it because I, I would think, like in this example that we were using, well, don't tell any man, but he's got good reasons for it, but I would go tell people because I would think, well, he's just being humble. Okay, let me tell you, he's got, he sees like we could never see. His ways are not our ways. And we, you know, the, the, the truest trust is when we just trust him without having explanations. As long as we're still asking for explanations from him, it means that the explanation is what's going to motivate us, not the voice. I was thinking about that today when, in John 10 where he said, I am the good shepherd, my sheep know my voice. Have you ever read that little section there that talks about it? And at the very end when he finished, it says, and, and the disciples understood none of those things which he said. What's the conclusion? Well, they must not be his sheep then, right? Because my sheep know my voice. He didn't say my sheep know my words. They didn't understand the words, but they knew the voice of the shepherd and they knew to follow him, you see. We don't always understand the words, but we know the voice. And, and there's many times, I'll tell you what, there have been times that I didn't know what the person was saying and I didn't, I, I, I didn't know if I could trust what they were saying because it was sort of unclear to me, but I could hear the voice of my Jesus. You know, you understand what I'm saying? I, when I listened to that person, I didn't hear them. I heard the voice of my Jesus. And I went, I, you know, dumb, whatever my excuse is, whatever my problem is, I'm going because I hear the voice of my, my Jesus. There have been other times that something would sound so good, but I didn't hear the voice of Jesus. And so it doesn't matter to me. So, anyway, sorry getting off on all that, but. You know, I mean, this really is just a walk. We're all in a walk. And this isn't about Bible school grades or even going to Bible school. This is about learning the Lord. And that's why we, we have these classes, you know. Great if you graduate. But the truth is you won't graduate until you're dead in your grave, you know. <laughs> all right. And the test will continue, by the way. All right, Luke chapter 17. Now, I want to give you an example of a reality that relates to official glory that is true. Uh, and so we'll just look at the verse. So John, uh, Luke 17, 7. But which of you having a servant plowing or feeding cattle will say unto him when he has come from the field, go and sit down and eat? And will not rather say unto him, make ready that which I may sup and gird thyself and serve me till I have eaten and drunk and afterwards thou shalt eat and drink. Doth he thank that servant because he did the things that were commanded him? I think not. So ye also, when you ye shall have done all those things which are commanded you, say, We are unprofitable servants. We have done that which was our duty to do. All right. So here, here is the fact of official glory. The Lord should be honored. The Lord should be obeyed. The Lord should be 
lifted up, certainly above our own selves and our own comforts. Amen? All of that is, can we say that all of that official <coughs> glory is due him? All right. Well, what we find, and, and I'll give you some scriptures to prove this in a second. I'll make my statements first. What we find is that a lot of times he is not giving, given the official glory that he is due. He is not honored in the true way that he should be. And people do not um, uh, open their hearts fully uh, in this manner. But this is still true. We are his servants. Instead of him saying, you go sit down and you eat and da-da-da-da, he has every right to say, Come, gird yourself, fix me something to eat, even though you've been working in the field all day. Amen? All right. Now, here's, here's the rub, and we'll get into the scripture that shows the difference. Here's the rub. What if you were in that situation? What if people should gird themselves and take care of you? What if... You should be honored over certain things that are true in the Lord. And what if they don't do it? What if they don't do it? What is the reaction? Is the reaction son of man? Is the reaction kenosis? Is the reaction a comprehension of the kind of man that God wants? Or is the reaction purity, old pride? I deserve this or I have this due or after you know after all I've done for you you know and uh, so let's uh, let's look at Mark chapter 6 and we'll see an example of what I'm talking about here <clears throat> Mark chapter 6 and let's start at verse uh, 30 And as we read this, do me a favor. Try not to just hear a story. Try to see, try to put yourself in Jesus' place. Or try to put yourself in a situation that is similar to this and see what your reaction would be. Okay, Mark chapter 6 and verse 30, starting in verse 30. And the apostles gathered themselves together unto Jesus and told him all things, both what they had done and what they had taught. And he said unto them, Come aside into a desert place and rest a while. For there were many coming and going, and they had no leisure so much as to eat. And they departed into a desert place by boat secretly, and the people saw them departing, and many knew him, and ran afoot out of all cities, and went before them, and came to gather unto him. And Jesus, when he came out, saw many people, and was moved with compassion toward them, because they were as sheep, not having a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. And when the day was now far spent, his disciples came unto him, and said, this is a desert place, and now the time is far past. Send them away, that they may go into the country round about, and into the villages, and buy themselves bread, for they have nothing to eat. And he answered and said unto them, give ye them to eat. They said unto him, shall we go out and buy two hundred denarii worth of bread, and give them to eat? And he said unto them, how many loaves have you? Go and see. And when they knew, they say, five and two fishes. And he commanded them to make all sit down by companies upon the green grass. And they sat down in ranks by hundreds and by fifties. And when he had taken the five loaves and two fishes, he looked up to heaven and he blessed and he broke the loaves and he gave them to his disciples to set before them. And the two fishes divided he among them all. They all did eat and were filled. And they took up 12 baskets full of fragments and of the fish. And they, and they that did eat of the loaves were about... 5,000 men. 
And straightway he commanded his disciples to get into the boat and to go to the other side before him unto Bethsaida while he sent away the people. And when he had sent them away, he departed into a mountain to pray. And when evening was come, the boat was in the midst of the sea, and he alone on the land. And he saw them toiling in rowing, for the wind was contrary unto them. And about the fourth watch of the night he cometh unto them, walking upon the sea, and would have passed by. And, but when they saw him walking upon the sea, they supposed it had been a spirit, and cried out. For they all saw him, and were troubled. And immediately he talked with them, and saith unto them, Be of good cheer, it is I. Be not afraid. <clears throat> All right. So the disciples return from ministry, and we just read in Luke chapter 17, if you work in the field all day long, and you come into the house, do you sit down and feed yourself, or do you take care of the master? And Jesus is the master. Well, they came... And Jesus pulled them aside and began to take care of them. In fact, I, let's see. Uh, Though the servants worked all day in the field, they should rise and meet his need, but instead he takes note of their need and moves to action to take care of them. Then he turns and ministers to the need of the multitude. He sees them as sheep scattered, and they see him as a shepherd, so he takes that place. Do you understand? So he takes that place. It's a place of selflessness. It's not a place of glory. It's a place of watching out for everybody else. Do you understand? It's not, you know, it's not what you think. It's not official glory. It is putting him in a position to take care of their needs. Uh, depending on how he is received is how he responds, either by official glory or glory of nature. And so uh, you see him taking note of the disciples' need, but them not taking note of his need. You see him sending them away so that they can get some rest, but he goes up to pray, but is... While he's praying, <laughs> he notices them out there toiling. And, uh, of course, in the meantime, he fed all the people. And he, he, he uh, even when he put them in the boat, he said, I'm going to put you in the boat. You go ahead, and I'll send the people away. I mean, this is all. Nobody is saying to him, look, you're the Lord. Why don't you get in the boat? We'll stay here. We'll send the people away. We'll take care of this, okay? You don't see that. You don't see that. You just, yep. Yeah. Yeah. And, and he's in prayer. He is, uh, you, you could almost say he is distracted by their need. And he rises to meet their need. And he did it about three times in a row. And um, and yet, Jesus never brings any of that up. He never brings any of it up. And, and I believe that he doesn't even go through anything over it. All right, now, now listen carefully. Why would he not go through something under those circumstances, but we would. Well, one answer would be, well, he's the son of God. He's sweet and we're not. <clears throat> well, that's, that's the wrong answer because you're a son of God too, by Christ. Uh, not only that, but he's really not the son of God in these situations. He's the son of man and he understands his place. Okay, what is his place? His place, and you're going to hear this a bunch throughout the rest of this course, his place is to take the place that the people give him. He 
we're going we're gonna to go over and over this. We're going to show it through scripture after scripture that he takes the place that the people give him. Kelly? following this so it like shows him from the very beginning of the day to the very end of the day going back up to pray to finally grieve over this, the first martyr and it was this, this guy John the Baptist and he never demands like you know how frazzled we get when someone dies and we need that time and it's like we should get this time to grieve it's, and Jesus never said I, my best friend just died or whatever I, my first follower my first martyr I just really need this time with my father he just kept I mean, all day long, never a chance to go cry. Even. And, and I mean, it was a long day, if you read that long. account. Starting with his best the, friend dying. From the moment where he heard it, he spent a long day. It's incredible the amount of material that's written there of what he ends up doing for others. And uh, John the Baptist was also his cousin, you know. <clears throat> um, so, uh, this... Uh, now, I ask the question, why did Jesus not respond with being upset or, or the fact that nobody's honoring him the way they should? Why did he not when we would? Okay, I think it's very simple. Jesus understood kenosis. Jesus understood kenosis. Jesus knew his place. We don't. We've been taught, well, you're a son of God. Well, you're a new creation. Uh, you are king's kids. Anybody been told you, you're a king's kid? Okay. Probably most of you. Well, guess what? You're not a king's kid. You're not the king's kid. Jesus is the king, and you're not Jesus' kid. Okay, you're the father's kid, but you're not a king, the king's kid, and Jesus is the king. So you're not a king's kid. I always hate to tell people, you know, they go, well, everybody else says we are. Well, you're not, <laughs> you know, but it's, but you know what? You heard it, and you believed it, and you never searched it out in the scriptures, and you never gave it much thought, and you grabbed hold of it to say, I'm a king's kid, I'm born again, and now I'm somebody special, and my whole life is going to be about everybody serving me, and angels are going to bow down and, you know, serve me and stuff, you know. You know, I, I had this thought today. This is the absolute truth. I thought this thought. Angels are watching over me, and regularly they're saying, no, no. <laughs> I mean, we, you know, if somebody says angels are watching over you, we go, oh, you know. But I mean, if they, you know, do they ever say, no, no? <laughs> we always have this good connotation. Maybe it's not so good. <laughs> so, not talking about sports teams, but, you know, uh, so I'm making a couple of points here. One is we get told stuff all the time, and we've swallowed hook, line, and sinker. And to swallow the line that you're a king's kid, number one, is not true. Uh, and number two, what sort of attitude goes along with that if you do swallow that untruth? Uh, I'll tell you what is more true, and that is... Jesus came as the prototype of the new kind of mankind, the new creation. One translation says, if any man be in union with Christ, he is a new species. Old things have passed away. Old what? Old species. Your old nature, your old way. Behold, all things are become new, not, not made better, you know, making you better. No, it's something new that you didn't have before. It's called Jesus' nature. And if it's Jesus' nature, then the prototype is the true way that all men should be. He is the um, ideal man, and then he is the prototype, and then he is the fulfillment of that in each and every one of us. 
Okay, so, so um, we're in a certain, I'll just say it like this, in a certain sense, we're not really walking as sons of God right now. We're walking as sons of men, but in a, as a new creation. That's what maybe why it says, um, Beloved, now are you the sons of God, but it doth not yet appear what you shall be. Well, I'm a king's kid. It's appeared. That would be our response to that, you know, to that scripture, that Bible verse. Well, I'm a king's kid. It has appeared. I'm a, you know, I'm somebody special. Maybe he's not trying to manifest your son of godness, your son of godship. You understand what I'm saying? When I'm, you know, first, maybe he's trying to do the same thing that he did with Jesus when Jesus became man or the first man or a new species of man. He's trying to bring us into kenosis so that God is first and foremost glorified not by God manifestations, but by son of man manifestations, selflessness, self-giving, putting others first, not putting your own needs first. What, what if that was really the case? And if it was and someone comprehended it, maybe there wouldn't be so much reaction. Maybe there wouldn't be so much pride over situations that, that happen to Jesus regularly. And we would just say, well, I'll, I take the place that people give me if they honor me with official glory then I will be that and and what we're going to do is we're we are going to we're going to go into the houses of a lot of different people in the scriptures we're going to visit the homes of Pharisees and tax collectors and many different people uh, we're going to sit down at the table with Jesus in these homes and we're going to see that in every case Jesus responds to them according to whatever they give him. And what they don't give him, they don't respond. He doesn't respond. He doesn't go beyond the bounds of uh, being something higher than a kenosis son of man or a kenosis new species that is just simply there to show forth the nature of God so that when people comprehend God from the very beginning, they comprehend his nature, not his works, and therefore get high-minded and puffed up. Does that, does that make sense? Is that good? Because I, you know, this is where we're going, and, and I know where we're going, and there's a lot of ground we'll cover in all of this stuff, but I'm still trying to lay the groundwork to make sure that we're sort of coming along in relationship to these things. <clears throat> um, uh, so my last statement I read was, depending on how he is received is how he responds, either by official glory or glory of nature. Another example is when they get in the boat and are troubled by winds and waves, they see him walking on the water, but, uh, but see him as one who saves them and comes to their rescue when in distress. They do not really see the one walking on water. They do not really give any sort of official glory like, you're God. It is your Savior. And so he responds as Savior. Peter starts sinking. Save me, he says. And so he pulls him up. We're going to get a lot clearer examples as we go, but just trying to, to lay some of this stuff. Um, to all the people, he was lovely in nature, so they wanted and needed him when a need arose. Okay. So here's what, we're, here's what we mean by that. <clears throat> they perceive the glory of nature. They perceive the selflessness of Jesus. Okay? And so they would only give him the glory of that, but it was not a true honor and glory from their hearts. It was those who are simply seeing the beauty of a selfless life and taking what they can get from it. Okay, 
So, um, that's why I said he was lovely in nature, but when they wanted something or they needed something, that's when they called on Jesus. And when, uh, when a, a situation of official glory came, you don't hardly ever see them calling on Jesus in the truest official glory. For example, when, when they came to take Jesus, you know, yeah, Peter cut off an ear, but then he went and ran and he hid and, and he denied him and da 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 Nobody stood up and said, you know what? This man, he is the son of God. He is the king of glory. He is the da 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 He is, they, they, didn't, they didn't honor him on an official glory basis because that would come in confrontation with others who had official glory, like Pilate or, or Herod or the Pharisees or the high priest. So they kept their level of honoring him on official glory down, lest it came back on their heads. Did you have your hand up? No. Basically, um, we don't see him as who he is. We just see him according to our needs. Well, that's, that's well said. We don't see him for who he is in the fullness of his official glory. We tend to see him. How would you put that? According to, our needs. According to our needs. And that's really the point I'm trying to make right now. Maybe even better said than, than I've been saying it. Um, I wrote here, we, we want to see him. We, we want him to be near in our weariness and our hunger, our danger. But we, oh, how did I say that? But we allow, but we don't allow entrance in issues of our selfishness or our tempers. We want him close for our need, but we don't really know what our real need is. You know, and I said, uh, in our selfishness or tempers or pride or, or um, uh, you know, I mean, pride's such a good one because, uh, unregenerated man is prideful religious man is prideful only Jesus is not and can anybody see the value of preaching a gospel that if uh, if unregenerated man is prideful and religious man is prideful can you can anybody see the benefit of preaching a gospel that says only Christ is not therefore Christ must be formed in you does that sound like does that sound right if he's the only one, I mean, you know, if, if we sin, what do we say? Well, nobody's perfect but Jesus. Okay, what's that, what does that mean? I mean, uh, for, for many who say that, it means, well, you have to forgive me that I did this wrong. But for those who said it when they haven't done anything wrong, there's no issue it's just nobody's perfect but, Je but Jesus. You need Jesus and I need Jesus and we all need him and we all need to conform to the image of Christ. Then it's no longer an issue of our need. It's an issue of the greatness and beauty of his life overtaking ours. Amen? And that comes from the heart. And we'll get into that because those things don't, as we will see throughout the Gospels, those things don't just dawn on. It's amazing. It, they, you know, we read stuff and we go, oh, my God, you know. I mean, you know, we see, you know, Jesus walking on the water. And just reading the story, we go, oh, my God, nobody walks on the water or stuff. It, it's the Son of God. I mean, don't we sort of when we read because it's a story to us. But the guy is in trouble. It was not a story. They just needed someone to save them. They don't notice the man walking on the water. They notice the guy that saves them from the storm. And no mention is, you know, made after that of it. <laughs> no official glory is going to be given. Okay, now, no official glory is going to be given you as you suppose. Did you have your hand up? You know, because we do, we do suppose that official glory is coming our way because why? Because we're laying down our life, and eventually, 
the grand finale of laying down your life will be official glory. Okay. I mean, that's, that's sort of the, you know, that's a fallacy. That could be a major fallacy in this place. What if the, you know, I was talking to somebody recently about this, and I thought, you know, what if, um, well, I was talking about how I knew men that they preached Christ, they preached the cross and everything, but the way they carried themselves in their day-to-day -day affairs and how they dealt with people was nothing like Christ crucified, okay? So, so you would say, but if I get everybody to that end where they know Christ and him crucified, then the means justify the end. You ever heard stuff like that? Okay. Well, that's what people, you know, whether it's applied to this subject or not, they say the means justifies the end. Well, when I was in Bible school, I said, the means and the end have to be the same thing. This is what came to my mind. If it's not, I'm a hypocrite. That, you know, all the people who claim I'm so bad for, for, for calling upon them to lay down their lives or to not say bad things or do bad things against one another don't realize that I'm not doing any bad things towards them or saying any bad things. They don't realize that. They don't. But I have to, if the cross and the lamb is the end, he must be my means too. And I'm voiding out everything that I preach if I can't, if I don't want to live it right now to reach that end. Okay. But then with time, I came to a new conclusion. You're going, well, you were right with that one. I don't think you need to be leaving it. Here's my new conclusion. That the means is the end. <laughs> that actually we're there now. As long as we're living Christ in this manner, we are living the end. And what if there was no end except to live Christ in all circumstances? What if that was really the end? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. And just uh, what I was going to say about earlier, what happens? What happens in uh, what happens to religion, uh, Christianity, as the religion of Christianity, if you will, when if supernaturally the things that Jesus did? Because I've heard so many times that the things that Jesus did, who could do these things? Who could ever do this? Who could do these things? I'm not going to go into a whole bunch of craziness about it, but. What happens if the enemy displays the same supernatural powers as then? What does that mean? Does that shatter your God then? What, what then, therefore, is Christ to you? If you have said, who else could walk on what? Who else could do this? Who else could do that? What if the enemy shows forth that these things are possible for him? Then what are you left with? Right. Who is Christ to you? Right. What is this? Who is this Christ? And it's like, it, it is this. It is this nature. It is this one who gives and loves and pours out. And that life, by living by another life, gives, you know, it's like that, that resurrection out of death, you know. That's who it is. Amen. And that will be one of our classes where I get into a lot of that in relationship to healing and miracle and all, miracles and all of those things. And those seen in light of the kenosis of Christ. Because... In a certain sense, you would think that that's not kenosis at all. That's, you know, you're not hiding anything. But we've already discussed that in the semester before where that wasn't him, it was the father. So it was kenosis. But there's another aspect of that, too, that I want to bring out this semester. Okay. Um, so, uh, you know, the last thing I said is that, that uh, we want him near in relationship to our need. 
We want him near in relationship to our problems. We want him near in relationship to our sorrows. And in, as a kenosis, new man, as the first of many, he, he does that. He did that to the disciples. He could have stomped and demanded, look, you guys, you need to start taking care of some of the stuff, you know, taking care of me in this situation, whatever. He never did that, and it never became an issue because he understood kenosis. We get prideful, and then we, and then we get hurt. For, forget the wickedness of pride or it's just the fact that we get hurt. We, you know, we get hurt because well, somebody didn't, you know. After all I've done for them, you know, and I, I, I gave them money. I did this. I did that. And well, okay. So was, were you doing that to get a reward? And the reward would be official glory. follow me or did you do that because it is the glory that you've been called to present in manifestation as a demonstration of the new man and the new species that's the question and that's where that's where a division comes because you know we're all hurt over over the fact that we gave God glory, the glory of nature, when we gave them time, when we gave up our precious time and ministered to them, when we gave up money and we ministered to them. That's where the glory went. But now we're going, well, I want to get some. See? And, it, and that will only come up. It will only come up if kenosis is not understood. It will only be an issue if our greatest glory is not found in. And Jesus said this, didn't he? Say stuff like this. You want to be the greatest? Then let him be the servant of all. Let him be so kenosis. You following that? Let him just be really just given to kenosis. That then he's great in my book. And that's the greatness. Not that's going to lead to the greatness. And so God, God begins to revamp our thinking. He begins to change our views. He begins to bring us into his heart. He begins to, and with that, guess what? He opens our eyes to the gospels. He opens our eyes to Jesus' reactions or lack of reactions. You know, the lack of what it says about Jesus' reactions is just as powerful as what it says that he died. You know. Uh, the, the lack of you, you know, throwing a fit or getting all puffed up over something, the lack of that says a lot. <laughs> it's, it's glorious. I mean, even the blood of Abel speaks. We say, well, no, the victory of Abel. No, the fact that he gave the right offering. No, no, the blood of Abel yet speaks. It speaks of giving himself. It speaks of being innocent. It speaks of being right with God and still dying. What sort of deal is that? That ain't right. Well, not maybe not in movies, but trust me, you're not a movie star. <laughs> so quit living like you are. <laughs> you know, and allow the kenosis to begin to work in you, or there's another way Paul put it just slightly different, let this mind or let these attitudes be in you, which were also in Christ Jesus, who, da -da 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 -da, and all of it's a downward spiral or steps. <clears throat> all right, so, so, uh, to allow Jesus in close over our need and everything. We'll get into this later, probably not to, tonight. But 
there's the potential, even though we're selfish, there's the potential of all of a sudden catching a glimpse of him in selflessness. Maybe a wild thought comes to your mind. He's, he's not reacting the way I would have if I was in that situation. That's the beginning of enlightenment right there. It's the beginning of enlightenment. If you pursue it, if you pursue that on out, it's the beginning of enlightenment of this one. We're talking about not Jesus the Son of God or Jesus the Son of Man or any of that. If you strip God away and you, you know, as far as a concept and, and as far as power and whatever, and you strip man away and you go right to the essence, you're perceiving what God really is. Now you're perceiving God. Now you understand your father because this is his essence. Now you understand Jesus because that's his essence. Now you understand the Holy Spirit because that is his essence. And then he can, he can bring you into all sorts of other stuff. And if you get the essence right, then none of the other stuff's going to trip you up. But if you don't get the essence right, you just get the trappings and, well, we're kingdom people. Well, first of all, you don't even understand what the kingdom is. The kingdom of God is within you. It's a hidden kingdom. It's an inside kingdom. It's a kingdom of nature. It's being governed by a nature. But we want a big outward, you know, manifested glorious kingdom. All right, so they just showed me a sign and said, please shut up on that. It says seven minutes, please shut up. See it back? Did you see it? You, some of you saw it. And that, there it is. And uh, so I'm going to do that. So we'll take a break and come back shortly. <laughs>